it's very complicated because you see, obviously there is propaganda on all sides. Mm -hmm. So there is a problem, but the problem is that we are sub subjected to a vast propaganda machine from the NATO country, let's call NATO land, and then there is a very small propaganda coming from the groups which are under attack now, Syria or Libya at some point. There is a very small group who are trying to do counter. Of course, you have to use their arguments to counter the propaganda, but you have to always be very careful not to get trapped into arguments that can be used against you because they, are f they can be proven to be false. You see, so there are many war lies, especially about previous wars, where we are on safe ground because there we can prove, you know, we can prove that uh, we can prove uh, that uh, we can also uh, that. Uh, you know, uh, many things that have been said about the Libyan war, for example, war for mm -hmm. about the Iraq war, you can always repeat past lies. Because they what's happening now is always delicate because it's difficult to know. But of course, one should ask the Syrians. I talk to Syrians, and I talk to Syrians who are against the intervention to get their point of view. But I prefer to develop arguments that are not too much dependent on the situation in Syria because I cannot know reliably what the situation in Syria is. It's the I. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a physicist, I have a job. I mean, uh, you have a job too. I mean, uh, if you have a full-time job, then how do you get to know a country which you don't speak the language, you've never lived in, you know, how, how do you know? I mean, I have no doubt that uh, there was a dictatorship, there was repression, and so on and so forth. So many of the claims of the opposition must be true, but what is true and what is false, I don't know. I mean, so I like to develop more sort of, you know, basic arguments that can be used against intervention, whether it's in the election in Ukraine or whether it's in Syria and so on in order to promote world peace, cooperation, an equal world, etc., etc., uh, rather than getting into the details of the case. But of course, if they say, oh, there is this mass murder in some place, and then you can say, well, we have pictures showing this and that, then of course you have to use these pictures if mm -hmm. they contradict the propaganda. Because the propaganda is always doing the same thing. We are the good guys, the other are monsters, and somebody has to stop them. And they do that all the time, and if you deny that, then you have a local denial and so on. And, you mm -hmm. know, The war, I mean, the war of ideas don't stop. You see, the the war of ideas does not stop. And of course, compared to the situation, okay, the Libyan war was pretty depressing for me because of the unanimity in Belgium in favor of that war. The whole parliament voted for the war, so including the so-called far right, which is also for humanitarian wars, uh, and uh, and uh, there was nothing in the press. No, no intellectual said anything, even not, not I, because I thought it was useless, so I said things on the internet, but not on, in the press. And so there is this, uh, you know, constant uh, problem that, uh, I mean, that uh, the, the victory of the human, the human rights intervention has been very strong, but of course, on the other hand, if Syria resists, then the more they resist, of course, the more people start to, you know, worry and they realize that the intervention would not be so easy, so they hesitate, military people hesitate. If they win in Syria, then they'll go after Iran, okay, good luck, because Iran is a much stronger country, it's more uh, mm -hmm. willing to fight, more united, they have a sort of a religious ideology that unites them and so on, so it could be very, it could be much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So, yes. we'll see, inshallah. <laughs> I mean, uh, we have yeah, to wait till, uh, we have to see how uh, things develop. Mm -hmm. No, it's not against Islam. That's not true. It's not too simple. Islam is a big religion with a billion people or so, or more than a billion people. You can't say there is a war against Islam. You see, because, for example, in uh, now in the, in the Middle East, the Western powers are allied with Saudi Arabia and Qatar, who are very fundamentalist version of Islam, as far as I understand, and they are supporting them for reasons which are probably complicated because, uh, you see, there is these people, Israel and the West, and they are sort of allied against secular nationalist regime, but probably it's a, you know, it's a game of fools because it's not clear that they all have the same agenda, okay? So, uh, so for example, in Libya it's not so clear that the West has won because in the end who wins there is not so clear. If the country is unstable, it's not so clear that that's a good thing, again, from a capitalist point of view. And uh, but but it's clear that Qatar and Saudi Arabia have an ideological agenda, religious agenda, 
and they are this and they are supporting this Islamist movement a little bit everywhere. So the situation is complicated. You can't say that the war against Islam because Iraq, Syria, Libya were secular regime. There is certainly a war against Iran, but Iran again that's related then to the Israeli question, the fact that the Iranians are very supportive mm -hmm. of the Palestinians and that creates an Islam per se, in fact, it's, support, it's mm -hmm. supported by reactionary, the most reactionary and the most backward part of Islam. Now, there's also a problem of the, the migrants here, okay, the, all the people who call migrants or Muslims mm -hmm. here. That's different. I wouldn't say, call it a war, but there is, of course, a sort of a conflict, an ongoing clash, conflict, of, clash, of, clash yeah, of civilization, super. which is again, it's again funny because, they, you know, these. Uh, Again, a, a part of the human rights discourse is, can again be hijacked to demonize the Muslim because they say, look, they are not nice with the women and they are not uh, mm -hmm. sharing our values and so on. But nobody says, tells what to do. What are they going to do? They are going to throw them out? Or what are they going to do? Do you think this moralizing is going to do anything? I mean, mm -hmm. so it seems to me that. Um, Yeah, there is a sort of humanitarian intervention in the Muslim communities in the sense that the, the, good, the do good are again think that by lecturing the Muslims they are going to make them change. But of course, they shouldn't lecture them, they should discuss with them, but they should first of all tell, let them be free to express their views in, in the ways that they want to inter express them. Mm -hmm. Then, one should discuss, one should, I think, try to you know, fight the most uh, religious or the most aggressive religious aspects, but one should. Discuss, uh, fight them through discussion, which is impossible once you use repression against it. Once you have to choose between discussion and repression. If you choose repression, then discussion is out of the window. So you have to allow, in fact, freedom in order to discuss. And that's made impossible by the demonizing and so on. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a little bit like, <laughs> like that. But of course, it's contradictory because during the Libyan war, for example, I saw a certain number of Muslim, or not all of them, but some of them were for the intervention because they didn't like Gaddafi because he was too secular. So there's something absurd to see a French government bombing Gaddafi and then preventing girls to wear the veil in school and then bringing Islamists in, or at least some Islamists in power in some part of Libya, I don't know exactly what the situation mm -hmm. is now, and being doing common cause with Saudi Arabia and Qatar against Syria. I mean, it's just something, it seems to be also... You see, they, that's why I don't think there is a plan, you see, because there is no, if the capitalists were, were running things, then we'll have a very different foreign policy. But the foreign policy is run by contradictory lobbies, ideologies, the human rights ideology, uh, which is leading in one direction, uh, the Zionists leading in not exactly the same direction. Uh, then you have, of course, also the oil and uh, economic interests are playing a role, but not exactly in the same direction. And so we don't get, a, it's not true that we have a coherent foreign policy, I think. No, I think, uh, you know, in the situation, of course, look, every, in every war, okay, in every war that I know of, when the country who is waging the war is in a winning situation, the people who are against the war are always in a weak situation and they are always being demonized, etc. You know, Bertrand Russell, for example, who is somebody I greatly admire, was opposed throughout the war to World War I. But when the war ended, he wasn't very happy because he saw the same crowd that were rejoicing in England, of course, at the end of the war, he saw that they were the same crowd that four years before were rejoicing at the beginning of the war. And of course, the problem there with the victor is that he, they imposed the Versailles Treaty and then, as predicted by Keynes, then that led to another war. And, uh, it was something, you know, you, uh, I mean, you, you have to understand that what we, when, when the, our side is winning, the anti-war movement is always in a weak situation, because that was the case throughout history, when people are, to some extent, nationalists, and when they win, it's like their soccer team is winning, and you know, mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do about it. But of course, when the situation is getting more difficult, for the, like, when, like it is apparently in Syria, and uh, probably be with Iran, then of course people start to think about alternative to wars. Okay? Mm -hmm. The Germans, for example, have been very anti-war <laughs> after World War II, but of course they, they were a reason for that. You see, they, they defeated the Japanese war also. I mean, uh, I mean now, of course, it's, 
even in Japan and Germany, it's unfortunately changing, but for a long time, it's up to Kosovo at least, they were, you know, they had the slogan that no war will start from German soil, and it changed with Kosovo, but it, it, it's uh, something which has been, uh, there, there is an anti-war sentiment in countries that have been defeated. Of course, the problem is when the, Uni the United States also, they have lost a lot, they have not been completely defeated in Iran and Afghanistan, but it has been sort of a draw in one case, and a sort of soft defeat in the other. And so then, again, the anti-war sentiments are growing, right? Mm -hmm. But being anti-war is sort of a, you see, it requires thinking, it's an intellectual, the problem is always an intellectual, rather sophisticated intellectual position. It's not, well, I mean, there's sort of, there is a sort of a macho and instinctive sentiments, let's go and we are the good guys and we are going to win, etc. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, the problem. It used to be nationalism, now the nationalism of the West has become the human rights business, but they still see sentiment, you know, we are going to civilize the savages and so on for war. And so it's only when things go badly that uh, people mm -hmm. start to think. But when it's do badly, it's only things do badly, go badly between Israel and its neighbors, uh, things go badly, I think, with Iran, maybe with, with Syria, I, I still don't know how it's going to come out. But of course, mm -hmm. it went badly in Afghanistan, so those people start to think. So the anti-war movement is not, it's dead, it has self-destructed itself with humanitarian intervention, but of course, it doesn't mean that it's completely, it's not mm -hmm. going to be revived in some sense.